the book. Yeah. This is a, a book called Understanding Social Problems. And it was, uh, we had one of our men's rights guys on the East Coast. He was taking a college class. And he got really upset. This was the textbook. Hmm. And he wanted us to do something about it. Okay, we'll take on the educational system next week. Right? Anyway, so I ordered up the book. Okay, let's see what he's talking about. Very interesting stuff. Uh, so this is, I'm not sure if it's in a social studies class or an anthropo social anthropology class, but something like that. Okay? Mm -hmm. Understanding social problems. And it's interesting, they have a section in here on domestic violence and then a partner violence and abuse. And it's one of our issues, hotspot issues. And so just to go through a few things. Mm -hmm. Okay? It says, globally, one woman in every three has been subjected to violence in an intimate relationship from the United Nations Development Program 2000. Wow. One in three. That means that every two girlfriends you know, you know one that's been abused, right? I don't. But you don't? Uh, but maybe they don't talk about it. What a surprise. Mm. Actually, it probably didn't happen. Mm. Just like it didn't happen one in six men are abused. They expand the definition. Mm -hmm. But then what they don't talk about here is what's the definition of abuse. Mm. So, but it leaves you with the impression. What's your impression? Like somebody got beat up, right? Mm -hmm. Badly, maybe. Put in the hospital, maybe, perhaps, right? Mm -hmm. They don't talk about, well, maybe the definition of abuse includes, oh, being screamed at once. Verbal abuse? Verbal abuse. I think women scream at men. Oh. <laughs> but it's not discussed, so it's the impression it leaves, correct? Mm -hmm. Okay. In the United States, most acts of intimate partner violence, parentheses, 85% are committed against women. What? What? 85% are committed. This book's 2011. How can that be? How can it possibly be that this is in this book when that has been disproven more times than I've climbed those steps going out to the parking lot? How can this be when the evidence is so easy to find? How can this be when Dr. Martin Fiebert is compile the bibliography, the biggest bibliography in the world of scientific research about abused men, which shows this is not true. How can this possibly be when uh, there's now evidence based on the internet, available to everybody, a project by John Hamel and some of the leading researchers in the entire world on domestic violence has compiled the biggest composite research on DV anywhere on the planet, which shows this is not even close to being true. How can it be? This is in a book 2011, how can it be? So what's the motivation? <sighs> However, 23% of men have experienced physical, sexual, or psychological interpersonal, interpersonal violence compared to 29% of women. Excuse me? Where'd that come from? I've never even heard that number anywhere. Mm -hmm. I mean, I'm on the DV Council. I mean, I've been doing this stuff for a long time. I've never heard this anywhere. Where'd it come from? comes from the National Center of Injury Prevention and Control, 2006. Wow. Do you realize if you went to the CDC, this is very interesting, I can remember in terms of this book, too, a few years ago, I wish I could find this. So I got some email, and it was one of the, like the feminist majority or something list. And one woman said, we have to get control of the CDC. We have to get control of the CDC. And, of course, I just passed it, flaked it out, didn't think anything of it, then it dawned me what it was. And I haven't been able to find the email, but if you went to the CDC website <laughs> three years ago, you will find charts that, that show about who commits the uh, most child abuse. And it's you guys, not us. Really? Well, we're not even close. <laughs> it's, really? it's mothers. Well, it makes sense if you think about it. You know, then we've got fatherless homes. I mean, it just makes sense, right? Mm -hmm. But the safest place for kids are in a home with their biological father. That's the safest place for a kid. Also, safest place for a the mother. Although the feminist movement would have you believe it's the most dangerous place. Remember Football Sunday? Mm -hmm. You've heard that one? No. most dangerous place to be in is a, is a woman in their own home on Football on Super Bowl Sunday. That was a Sheila Kuehl myth that's been dispelled by Christine Off Summers a number of times. Lies. Just lies. One lie, one lie after another. One, one exaggeration after another. 
Uh, when women assault their male partners, these assaults tend to be act of retaliation of, or of self-defense. What? Self-defense? That's been disproven so many times. That once again, the stare analogy. I mean, it's that's absolute garbage. Hmm. Absolute garbage. Well, most women get seriously injured in domestic violence situations when they attack the male first. Hmm. Fact. Okay, this just keeps going on and on and on through the whole book, okay? Or through this whole section. Now understand that this is for young college kids. So this is what we're teaching them in school. And why would you have any reason to disbelieve your instructor, right? Okay, I figured this mm -hmm. was going to happen when I read this. I didn't have a big problem with it. But then I got over here, and this was kind of interesting. The effects of intimate partner violence and abuse. Each year, intimate partner violence results in about 2 million injuries and 1,300 deaths nationwide. Really? How come we're not talking about men and women anymore? We're mm -hmm. just talking about deaths. More than three-fourths of the murder victims killed by an intimate partner are women. Hmm. How many is that, by the way? i got to tell you, it's not very many. Mm. Matter of fact, in our society, with 330-some million people in the United States of America, there's only about 1,400 violent deaths, criminal violent deaths of women a year. Hmm. For all reasons. Horrible, but not significantly huge, right? Hmm. So this goes on and on and on, and then what gets down here, battering also interferes with women's employment. Wow, it doesn't interfere with men's employment? Right? I mean, if you were a battered man, do you think you would you go to work every day and everything's fine and it's no problem coming home? And some abusers prohibit their partners from work. Really? Yeah, that's true. Other abusers deliberately undermine women's employment by depriving them of tra transport. Just women. Just women. I guess that never happens to a guy. Harassing them. A guy never gets harassed at work. Turning off alarm clocks. Well, that's serious. Turning off alarm clocks, making them late. Beating them before job interview. But only women. Never happens to a guy. Most people would not even pick this up. I see the significance. I think somebody mentioned the word brainwashing early on. How subtle can it get? So then I say, what's the motivation? Who are the editors of this book? Who had to approve these passages? Wouldn't that make an interesting film? Well, who did? I don't have a clue. I really don't have a clue. But certainly, somebody controlled this text. It is written, it is written as if it were written by a radical feminist or, or somebody on the San Diego Domestic Violence Council, perhaps. You know, there's no difference in this whole passage really toward men, as if they simply don't count. There's even a passage in here that talks about, about uh, there are shelters for women and children. Not men. That's accurate. Pause. Yeah. Does it make any sense to you guys? It, you? it does. It's you understand very this the way it hit me? You, yeah, maybe you have to understand, though, that... You know, I've grown up with the feminist ideology in all of my books. Yeah. And I am... That's the point. And I'm a woman, and, and the largest group of feminists are women my age. It's a growing movement because it's a young women's movement. Oh, that's interesting. When any, you know, majority is in a younger generation, it's, it's a growing movement. So, it's very difficult for me to wrap my brain around this because, you know, that's the book I would be reading. Exactly. Um, so, when, just give me a second, because I'm overwhelmed with how much information you just gave. I mean, I would um, if I were you, I'd be so pissed about being lied to. I would be so angry, I couldn't even, I, I would be totally beside myself, you know. And I don't want my children, my grandchildren, to learn this crap, because that's exactly what it is. And unfortunately, it comes from well-meaning people. You know, I can remember a couple of times San Diego Domestic Violence Council. I used to go wearing my T-shirts that feminist lives make bad laws. And, man, they'd look at me like, oh, my God, here's Harry again. Oh, my God. 
You know, I wear this one, prosecute false accusers. They were, we had a situation when they first opened up the Family Justice Center, they had a 40-hour volunteer training. I was going to go volunteer, right? You know, I'm pretty good at working with people. I've interviewed thousands of them. You know, I've helped them. And so I'd wear my T-shirts. And Gail Streck came in, you know, she was, teaches one of the law schools, and she was a big mucky-muck in the TV, world TV industry. And one day she comes through with a group of judges from Czechoslovakia, all women except one guy. And there's like 12 of us in this training. And she herds them all in to show them the new Family Justice Center, this beautiful facility. And she goes around the world, room introducing everybody, and every time she gets to me, she skips me. <laughs> <You know? laughs> and she finally gets to, she can't go anywhere. I'm the last guy. And so she's got to say, and this is, this is, well, this is, this is Harry Crouch. He's with, he's with the national, he's a men's rights advocate. <laughs> and she could barely get it out. And all of a sudden, from the middle of this group, this guy stands up on his tippy toes and his arm shoots up like this with a peace sign and he goes, Ryan! <laughs> it's the judge, the male judge. The room just cracked up. The point I'm trying to make here, I went to lunch with the women because they knew. They knew women could be abusive all by themselves. If I went to lunch with the guys, I was shunned. What is it with you, Harry? You're bad mouthing women. You're, you know, you, women aren't violent. Us. You need to accept that. Excuse me. That's what they want you to believe, and not only they want you to believe it. I think some of it's inherent in the way we're raised. You know, don't hit your sister. Well, that makes sense. But. If Johnny gets out of line, you just kick the crap out of him. That doesn't make sense. You know? If you're going to teach nonviolence, you got to teach nonviolence to both. It's not gender specific. You don't make, need to make up lies. You don't need to blame one party or another. You just need to say <laughs> violence is inappropriate. And whoever hits whoever is going to, there's going to be a consequence. In the state of California, you may understand, you may remember that we've had some difficulty with our correctional institutions and overcrowding. Mm -hmm. Matter of fact, we were put under federal oversight, right? Mm -hmm. And we were ordered to reduce the population of our prisons. And so what's the first thing we did? Do you remember? Becoming more lenient on women? We opened the doors to pr women in prison. And we let women out of prison, not men, but we let women out of prison, some of whom had done exactly what men had done and were in prison for. Now, why would we do that? Do you know that England, as we speak right now, there's legislation that's being pushed over there to completely do away with women or pr female prisons because they're figuring out a way to excuse all aberrant behavior of women? Hmm. Excuse me? Uh, is there a need for a men's rights movement? I don't know. You tell me. Does that make sense? Uh, it doesn't make any sense to me. Why would you do that? Does it make any sense to, in Alaska we call this Bernard divorce, if you got caught in bed with somebody else, a shotgun was nearby and it took care of the deal, and everybody in town kind of understood that, okay, let's get on with it. <laughs> you know. <laughs> Nowadays, though, the way it is, you know, we've got the battered spouse syndrome, right? 13 abuse excuses for women in court, none for men. The battered spouse of court, uh, the battered spouse abuse. Well, I, I didn't mean to shoot him 67 times, but my finger got stuck on the trigger when he was sleeping. You know, that's because I'd been abused for all these years. Okay, now let's not be facetious about it. Is there a real dynamic where somebody can be abused, seriously abused, and get caught up in the dynamic and not leave? Absolutely. Absolutely. It's a nightmare. Absolute frickin' nightmare. Okay? But should that be some justification for murdering somebody? Should it? It's a hard one. I don't know. Really? I mean, if they really can't leave and they feel like that's their only way out. Oh. Okay, what if, if they're going to die? What if roles are reversed? I think the same. I mean... Would if, make sense, wouldn't it? If they're... If they think they're protecting their life, Huh. I haven't killed them. 
Do you genderless, me- you know. Do you remember the Rihanna situation? Oh, she was abused by James Brown, or what's his name? I don't know. Got beat. Bobby got beat up in a car? Man, that was fascinating. It was truly fascinating. And I'm not saying this guy's a saint. You know, but he's driving a car and she's kicking the crap out of him. That's what he went down. That's what was re- initially reported in the news. And he slugged her. He lost it and beat her up. Within 24 hours, man, that women's, that feminist machine, it just came together uh, and wrapped its arms around Rihanna and said, man, do we have an opportunity here. And they fired up Oprah Winfrey and everybody else. And off to the, ra- off to the races we went. I have one thought. Uh, Elena Bobbitt. Oh, you remember that story? Sure. Do you remember that, Kathy? No. Okay, she, um, mm. while her husband was sleeping, she cut off his penis. Yeah. Oh, yeah. That's unconscionable. What's interesting is in the subtlety of um, discrimination, if you will, you'll have women in a lot of the reality shows, you know, or on TV shows, so stuff that gets perpetuated, where they'll laugh about what Elena Bobbitt did to her husband. That's right. If I ever found my husband and, you know, with another woman, I'd cut off his view, and everyone jokes about it, ha, ha, ha. That's right. And there isn't any public outrage when this joke keeps being perpetuated. So if we reverse it and say a man cut off his wife's breasts or... It's horrific. Know, or, it's horrific. sliced her, you know, down there and, and stuff, and then it's, it's an ongoing joke mm-hmm. in our media mm-hmm. and, and pop culture and all that. Everyone's like, we'd be outraged. But Even not. if he'd been abused for right, years and years right. and years. Yeah. Right. And we're not outraged because that's what they teach you. They don't teach you to be outraged about injustice anymore unless the injustice is gender specific. I think that's outrageous. You know, I've, I've literally worked with thousands of felons. I mean, I've interviewed thousands of them. I've interviewed baby bouncers, acid throwers, murderers, muggers, serial killers, bank robbers, you name it. I've been in a cell with them and I've talked to them. Right? Mm-hmm. There's some horrible people out there. But dang, I mean, injustice is injustice. You pay the price for whatever your behavior should be, and it shouldn't be gender specific. A murder is a murder is a murder. Are there mitigating circumstances? Yeah, that's why they're called mitigating circumstances. But they shouldn't be gender specific either. There should not be 13 abuse excuses for women and none for guys. It's absurd. It's crazy. The most recent study out of Harvard shows that 70% of domestic violence, one on one, is perpetrated by you guys, not us. And the more we learn about intimate partner violence, the more that becomes clear. In in dating violence on college campuses, man, we're not even close. How do you define violence, though? Well, once again, it's the definition, isn't it? Mm-hmm. So whatever definition they want to use. We've got some pamphlets out here. You're welcome to take a look at that stuff. There's a guy on the East Coast done some really good work. Richard, uh, God, I cannot remember the name. He's a retired police lieutenant. He's written a couple books. He teaches about domestic violence on a couple of co- colleges. I'll think of his name. He's really a great guy. And he started looking at uh, instances of intimate, per- intimate personal violence on, uh, between students on college campuses. Uh, and he started discovering some of these things, too. The point being, a lot of what we believe, a lot of what we taught, are taught isn't what really is. And so some of the things that are being taught, oh, like the CDC, I didn't finish the thing with the CDC. So three years ago, if you were to go to the CDC website, you could find charts that would show this. It would show how abusive mothers were and stepdads and biological fathers and who did what to whom, how many times. No more. The charts are gone. Now you go to the CDC and look, and they're all gender inclusive. They don't talk about who does what the most? Uh-uh. It's just parents or non-biological parents. Or, and why is that? Who's got control of the White House? We've got the White House Council on Women and Girls. and who, 
they have lateral authority in each department of the United States government, including the CDC, and that thought process, this thought process, is now being institutionalized top-down. And anything that suggests women should be responsible for their own actions is simply disappearing. And it, what's increasing is make, as things that make it easier to vilify and criminalize men. Hence, the Department of Education order to college campuses. I was try okay, I have a hard time with statistics because Me you too. can find statistics on either side to support either and granted who knows if they're made up statistics or true studies, but you can find statistics to support either side. And that's what, you know, the feminists are using. Oh, we're gonna use the one in four women are uh, sexually assaulted in their lifetime and so this is what we're gonna stick with or the answer, the answer's easy. Um what's that? The answer's easy. That, that comes from a study conducted by who? Miss Magazine. Miss Ma MS Period Magazine commissioned that study. Well, I, I started Googling to find out what statistics I could find. And, and I feel like, correct me if I'm wrong, I feel like the CDC is really the most reputable statistics you can find. You'd think. Website. You'd think. And just like a couple of days ago, I looked up domestic violence on the CDC, and it said 83% women and then the rest men are victims of domestic violence. Well, then you have to question that. Because there's so much contra I just try to explain that. They got control of the CDC. The CDC used to be an extraordinarily reputable organization. You could bank by it. We used to use their numbers. I don't use them anymore. There are other authorities you can go to, study after study after study, hundreds, hundreds, and hundreds, and hundreds of them, not just one or two, hundreds and hundreds and hundreds. I'll give you the links. It's easy, Martin Fieber. Look up Martin Fieber domestic violence. Boom. You should go interview the guys right up there in Cal State Long Beach. You love Is he an MRA? No. He's a common sense guy. He's a political mm -hmm. science professor who maintains the largest bibliography and you know, research on abused men on the planet. Mm -hmm. Nice guy. Just a nice guy. That's what I he know, does. I still feel like, because his... He focuses on men's issues, so isn't that the equivalent of Ms. Magazine doing a study? There's a big difference between an unscientific, one unscientific study from Ms. Magazine and almost 2,500 academic papers and research studies from social scientists. There's a big difference. And if you were to put them on a scale, which way, which way do you think that scale would weight? Mm. And when you put a study from Ms. Magazine? Well, they probably had scientists doing this. Actually, they didn't. Go back and look at the research. They didn't. They just, it's how they put the questions together. Do you realize that a lot of the women in that study who said they had been raped went back to live, either date the man that supposedly raped them? And a lot of them, by their own admission, didn't even know it was rape? Hmm. I mean, read the history on this. It's ridiculous. It's not, it's just ridiculous. And this is. <laughs> This is what they do over and over and over and over again. First, they try to identify a problem. If one doesn't exist, they create it. Okay, now we create it, we have to substantiate it. So the work, what we're going to do is we're going to cause a controversial study to take place, and we're the ones that are going to conduct it. And we have predefined outcomes. We're really not interested in the truth. What we want to do is substantiate our position. And once we've substantiated our position, we'll bring in the media and we'll sell it to the media, and the media will take it out to the public and make people believe it to be true. Over and over and over and over again. And you can find the methodology in Rules for Radicals, which is a guidebook that these people, some of them use. Mm -hmm. You can see it's written down there. Here's, here's how you do it. Boom, 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 boom. All I gotta do is open the page and Go down and read the, read the, take what you want on my bookcase. <laughs> you know, they'll, they'll tell you. They, they don't try to keep it a secret. Fascinating. They just know most of us are stupid. Yeah, and 
the mass majority just eats up whatever mainstream media tells them? Most of us are good people. We have things to do. We want to play baseball. You know, I want to take my daughter to the dance. I want to make sure uh, I want to get get that second job paycheck from there again. Do a little something extra for the family. We got to fix that four wheel when we go to the river. We got to put some food on the table. I don't have time for this crap. I don't even know what you're talking about. I don't even care what you're talking about. Doesn't doesn't impact me. Right. But when it does, when it does, I can tell you why you guys are here. Why? And I, I can tell you, I don't think you mean no. I'll tell you why you're here. It's because this stuff we're talking about now has touched, adversely touched, in one way or another, everybody in this country. Everybody. And maybe it didn't come up and bite you directly on this arm. But maybe it's a neighbor or a friend or a relative, somebody. And all of a sudden you look and there's something not right here. Something not right here. It just that doesn't doesn't pass the smell test anymore, right? For the longest period of time before it adversely impacted everybody directly or indirectly, and then got away with a lot. And I've been hesitant not to go somewhere. I'm still trying not to go there. I'm not going to go there. I think it's a little too controversial. But well, I'm not going to go there. <laughs> well, I, I'm, not a, I'm not a historian, I'm, and I'm not a political scientist, so I really don't want to go there. I mean, there's other motivations for this movement aside from enlightenment and oppression. I mean, if, do you feel oppressed? It's hard to say. Really? Yeah. Wow. Do you feel oppressed? No. <laughs> <laughs> Can you shut that door? I mean, has anybody you ever applied for a job and said you're not being hired because you're a woman? Or you know, when I grew up, most of my bosses were female. I you think know? everyone has their own experiences. Probably you know? so, right? And that's why personally for me it's hard to understand the men's movement because I haven't walked in your guys' shoes. Mm. Well, like I said, I'm not sure about the men's movement part, but uh, unfortunately there's just so much misinformation going back and forth. You know, I always bring it back, what's the motivation? You know, if you come back and you say, what's the motivation? You can't find an altruistic reason for it. You can't find truth. Uh, I think we're in trouble because then there's something else, something sinister is afoot. And then you have to ask, well, what is that? Why is it? And how do we fix that? Because it's like you know, a rotten root to a plant. Pretty soon it's going to kill something. And you really have to kind of dig it out and root it out. I don't care whether it's a man being a jerk or a woman being a jerk. It is inconsequential to me. Okay? We have to stop, stop the jerkism. That's what we have to stop. Okay? So if you want to put labels on it, put labels on it. I don't think labels particularly help myself. Matter of fact, I think labels detract from solutions um, because then it becomes shame, blame, and guilt. And where do those concepts come from? Duluth Power and Control Will. You guys know about that? Mm -hmm. I'll give you a copy. In 1977, I think, a bunch of crazy women up in Duluth, Minnesota figured out they had the solution to domestic violence, and it was all about patriarchy and all about men. And it's the Duluth Power and Control Will. Because men are all about power and control. Of course, not you ladies. You guys, you don't control anything. You have no power. You're just sweet and innocent little things. Okay. So when this power and control wheel is divided up in all these things, you know, about who does this and who does that and blah, blah, blah. Of course, it's all men. Right? It's all men. And the entire domestic violence industry was founded on that. I think it's still 37 or 32 states in the United States that by law they have to use the Duluth model for better intervention programs and it's all shame, blame, and guilt driven. If you're a man and you walk in, you must admit you did it up front or you're in denial. There's no debate, there's no discussion, there's no possibility that you could be falsely accused the criminal justice system could have made a mistake. None whatsoever. You are in a state of denial and you will complete that course or you're going to go to jail. You will be re-engineered. 
frightening. Yes, that's frightening. I think it's terrifying. Absolutely terrifying. That we allow such stuff to happen in this country? I thought that was Russia. Maybe I got them confused. How can you do that? Oh, and this happens before there's been any criminal charges? Whoa, huh? You, know, you mean there's oh, they're not going to be any filed, probably? I mean, it's actually coming from a civil a family court, not criminal court. They can, can they can do that? Wow. Do they have these same programs for women? Oh, they don't? Uh, how, how is that possible? We don't need to re-engineer re women? For, I guess all you guys are just perfect mothers and... And never have issues, and it's just uh, it's just us guys, right? It's just us guys. It's a book up here, written by Mr. Geffner, who is the, I think, president of the Lyon University Violence Blah 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 graduate program, whatever the hell it is. Nice guy. Nice guy. And so he co-authored this book about. Better intervention programs for women. Oh, the recognition that there might be an abusive woman. Holy moly moly. And you read the introduction and how does it start out? Blaming men. Unbelievable. If the program is for men, it starts out blaming men. If the program is for women, it starts out blaming men. Oh, excuse me? what I do? You know, I don't know about... Did anybody else? I didn't do it. <laughs> I don't know where you came from. I didn't do it. You know, I'm trying to help people not be violent. How is that constructive? How is that? How is it constructive to let one whole gender escape responsibility for their actions by blaming them on somebody else? And yet you look at the other gender and say you're responsible for everything and you need to accept responsibility for it even if you didn't do it. I'm sorry. But if that's what it takes to have a men's rights movement, maybe we need one. Because that's just so nonsensically crazy. It's, it doesn't, for me, it doesn't compute. And we have a whole industry out there. Do you, you realize years and years ago, there was uh, Susan Steinmetz was the first a woman, first uh, academic to come out with a scientific paper that showed and suggested that perhaps more women abused men than Versa Risa. Oh man, you'd think she was had to go to the St. Louis trials. I mean, the academics burned her at the stake. They made bomb threats against her, tried to get her thrown out of the university, tried to get her tenure denied. She actually left academia for a few years until she came back in and joined a national study, the first national study on the Department of Violence ever conducted. And all three of those researchers were threatened with death threats. There were even meetings when they were making presentations and other social scientists stood up and said, there's no such thing as an abusive woman. What? You know, what planet did you fall off? If I could, where's the spaceship? Let's find it and round them all back up, shut the door, put some dynamite under it, and off into space they go. How can people with PhDs possibly take that position? It's the most asinine on its face. It's absolutely ridiculous. No, com no person who thinks objectively, to any degree whatsoever, could possibly arrive at that conclusion. You tell me, why do we need a Ms. Rice movement? I like this one. Well, you're just trying to take away all the gains made by... What? I'm trying to take away the gains made by... You think I can do that? <laughs> I mean, do I have that power? Really? I don't think so. And why would I want to do that? It's going to cost me more money. <laughs> I mean, it's going to take more of my time. You know, I want you guys doing what you want to do. Just don't bug me. Right? Contribute. Be happy. Have a great life. Show your kids. Show your family. Love your husband. Love the men in your life. Be a person. Be a human. Let me be a person. Let me be a human. Let's get along. <laughs> you know? 
And who the hell do you think you are that I'm supposed to give you some special consideration because you don't have a penis? What? You don't give me any because I do. Remember the husband. He didn't understand what he goes through. The stress, the pressures every day because we suck it up. We suck it up. The guy I worked with two days ago, 19 years in abusive situation. The woman's crazy. She's a narcissist. She's a megalomaniac. She's a control freak. She takes no responsibility for anything ever wrong that happens in the household. It's always his fault. Always, no matter what it is. All she does is go to Nordstrom's and spend all his money and buy clothes she never wears. She's corrupted her daughters and her son. Turned the children away from this guy and all he does is work his ass off. Excuse me? Why do we need a men's rights movement? You tell me. Maybe because we don't have that right. You know, people, when I say we don't have any, people say, excuse, I thought you men had all the rights. Well, show me. If you can show it to me, I'll wear it. You know, but I'm not buying it. You know, people have not showed it to me. Why aren't the prisons full of men? Because they're aggressive and abusive. Really? Hmm. Yeah, a lot of that's true. A lot of it's for failure to pay child support. Well, they're all deadbeats. That's where they belong. Well, do you realize that women who are similarly situated are more likely not to pay child support than men? How come we don't look at that? Because you don't have a penis. It's as simple as that. It's not even complicated. I mean, I can go on and on and on. You wanted examples? How many examples do you want? How about Obamacare? Do you realize that young men who have to buy insurance under Obamacare have to pay for paternity, or maternity insurance, in case they get pregnant, I guess? Maybe there's something going on in Washington even we don't know about yet. You know, maybe I'll wake up tomorrow and I'll have twins in my stomach or something. Now, why is that? What's the motivation? Okay. How come women won't step up and pay? Oh, they use 80% of the health services in the United States of America. 80%. So why do they keep reaching into our pocket? Okay, You're not reaching into your pocket to pay for mine. Right? Yeah, that's a great point. So why? What's the motivation? <laughs> I think it all goes back to Warren. Disenfranchisement, men, disempowerment. The more men you can extract from a family, the more men you can criminalize for the weakest offense. Uh, here's the example. I, I'm in the military. I'm a career military person. I've been in 18 years, and the only thing I want to do is put in my 30. I've been to war five times, been on so many deployments. I've been shot. I've got medals. I'm, all these things. And I'm in this situation. I'm falsely accused of domestic violence. I can't even have a gun, and they yank my security clearance. The military no longer wants to deal with me because now I'm a problem, so now I'm going to be kicked out. The family court doesn't give a shit. The family court is going to say, you still need to pay child support. You're going to still need to pay alimony. I can't. I no longer have a job. My career was taken away from me because I was falsely accused. No, I don't care. That's not our issue. I don't care. That's not our issue. When you do things like that, you expand definitions of domestic violence or crime where you can criminalize almost anybody for anything, and then you criminalize something like a, getting a temporary restraining order, which has a purpose, and that purpose should only be to keep parties apart so there's no injury. You don't criminalize the act of the issuance of restraining order, but they've done that. Why have they done that? Because now it creates a record. And who are restraining orders most often issued against? The man, not the woman, right? So now we've criminalized another man for doing what? Nothing. Doing absolutely nothing. We've criminalized him. Maybe we need a men's rights movement. Maybe that's a reason we need a men's rights movement. You add them all up. So what happens? So we're disenfranchising, we're disempowering. Why are we disenfranchising and disempowering men? What's the motivation? What do you think the motivation might be? Because men have all the power and control? Because we're so evil? Because if you walk out that door, everything you see was, has been built by a man? What's our contribution? 
Does that mean women don't have value? Well, that's ridiculous. Of course you guys have value. You know, or we wouldn't get in trouble so much. <laughs> guys. Okay? We're all in the same boat. We just don't seem to respect each other for who we are. And there's something sinister. There's some sinister aspect of our culture. Some sinister as something sick, something malignant, something horrifically destructive that hasn't even come close to tearing us apart yet. But we're getting there. And if we don't change something radically and do it soon, we're going to be in deep crap. And I think that's exactly what some of these people want. And that's where I don't want to go because that's not the way stepping out of men's rights or, or gender issues. Okay. But if you want to talk about inequities, I can go on for days. I think uh, we should take a break. <laughs>